So, we, uh, before we start Parashat Vayeshev, first of all, before we start, I first of all want to say a tremendous thank you for all the people. We had a problem with our PayPal account. And for three months or so, we were thinking, we were thinking that we were getting spam. It was going to a different email. It was like a whole big balagan, a whole big mishka bubble. And basically, the people that donated money for the yeshiva, you know, we never received the money and were sent back, and the funds were taken back, and so on and so forth. And then we figured out, but uh, we got tremendous support from people, which is really unbelievable. People from from really all over, from Norway, from down south. I mean, all over the place. So besides the 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 hakarat tov that we have for the funds that they help with the yeshiva, it is really unbelievable to to read uh, the, the kind words that people have and as hard as it is those words believe me I mean listen we need the money but believe me the kind words are more than just a a, uh, a vehicle or a tool for us to go forward the kind words are actually the engine the fuel that gets the engine going so I can't I can't even start telling you the the just kindness of people and appreciation and really makes the whole difference. It's just so. But since Jonathan is not here, and I know you're going to tell me to say that, questions could be addressed at rabbagon at gmail.com. Donations, if you want to see what we're all about, can go to the PayPal, which is working, uh, at yeshivaetzion.com. So feel free. And uh, welcome, my friend, to the Torah that never ends. That's the... Uh, uh, almost like an Emerson and Lekham Power song, but, <laughs> but we are going to talk about Parashat Vayeshev. Parashat Vayeshev starts with the words Vayeshev Yaakov Be'eretz Megore Aviv. And Yaakov settled down in the land of where his father lived. Rashi has a, a very interesting take on that, and he says, Bikesh Yaakov Lishevet Beshelva. Yosef. Yaakov wanted to sit down and tranquilo, right? Yeah, sit down, Baruch Hashem, you know, I'm on pension now, let me relax, I call Beseder. Because he wanted to do that, the whole incident of Yosef had started. That's what Rashi rings. So, of course, the question is, why? Why? So we're going to start a little bit off, and then we're going to try to focus. So one needs to know that uh, when Tzadikim are asking to settle down, to sit down, leave me alone in peace and quiet, the Kadosh Baruch Hu said to them, Lo dayan le tzadikim, ma shemetukan laim le olam haba. Isn't that enough for these righteous people what is waiting for them in olam haba? Sit down tranquilo, I call beseder, everything is okay. Right? It's not enough that they have that. They want to be peace and quiet in this world too. I mean, how much do you want? You have to excuse me. Um, I have allergies, so my eyes are closing. But so he says, Alamaze is not a place for shalva umargoa. It's not a place for for uh, tranquility and uh, taking it easy and you know. Copacabana. And the whole purpose of this world is not for that. If you think about it. Olamaze is what? What did it say? Ki Adam La'amal Yulad. A person was created to work. Amal is work. Of course. What kind of work? What kind of amal? It's up to you to decide. There is Amal Trabajo, working, Rabota, working, and there's Amal Torah. Which Amal you take, that's your, that's your, it's up to you, Habibi, up to you. But to sit down, to do nothing, that's not acceptable, that's not going to, that's not going to happen. We mentioned it many times that one of the greatest curses that the Torah or insults, the derogatory terms that the Torah can inflict on a person is Ben Blial, a useless person who lost a club, doesn't do a thing. So Ben Blial, it's horrible. Ben Blial, and lo yeul, and lo toilet. No purpose, no use for him. And really the biggest curse for a person is to have no purpose. 
This world is not for that. So we learned that the way for perfection in this world is doing work, and not only work, doing intense work, working hard. And that cannot come through menucha, peace and tranquility, and, you know, all these things that we are looking for. This world is called, Mark, how is called, what is called? Olam it's famous, right? He already knows where I'm going with this, right? This world is called Olam We work, we do things in this work, in this world. Why? Because only in this world you're allowed to, and you can do things and fix things. Only here. In the upper worlds, you can't change anything. Only here. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us, and that's in a way the beauty and the imperfection. It gave us the ability to do and to change things in this world. So you can't, so Yaakov, you know, you can't sit down. You know, you're looking to do something like that. Chazal said, Hayom la'asotam, machar lekabel shachara. In Masechet Avodah Zarah, it says, today to do the mitzvot and tomorrow to receive the shachar. You don't do the mitzvot now and then you want to win, uh, uh, you know, jackpot in the lottery. That does not happen. And if it does, you got a problem. As we said earlier, the kelim, the instruments to, to do things in this world are giving to us, and it's up to you to choose which of the, of the vehicles, the instruments, the apparatuses you're going to choose. It's up to you. You choose. You need to choose what's best for you. Which one is best for you and to to create in a way your own unique creation each and every one of us needs has a specific task in this world it needs to do you need to find something that is for you therefore the individualism but not out of selfishness the development of the individual for the purpose of the whole In many times in the world, they're trying either to completely dismantle the individual or to completely dismantle the whole and just create individuals that are parasites, you know, they, they, and selfish. But not here, not, well, not with us. We're not trying to do that. You can't do it. And sometimes you need to, sometimes you need to give up, sometimes you need to filter many things, you need to work hard, and so on and so forth. You need to, to throw what we call... Sh- Shvirat Kelim, breaking vessels in order to create new ones, recycling, right? Which recycle, if you think about it, is a very noble idea. Now we take useless things and we make something useful out of them. It's, it's, I, I like recycle. Of course, when I don't get tickets for no, for no reason, because then, then the city sees that as a way to make money. But uh, not for the purpose. But nevertheless, the idea of recycle is a noble idea. So Yaakov Avinu wanted to do so. And therefore, he, this whole ordeal with Yosef was a reminder for him that in Menucha Ba'olam Azeh, here, you're not resting. Menucha, Chaya Olam Abba, over there, in the other world. But, but let's see exactly what really happens. What, what exactly happens? Why is all these things happening? Is it only because, when I made a typo here again. I always make typos, you know, I just see it. And you know, I read it like a few times, but I didn't see it. I don't know, it's like typo monster we have here. But, uh, it's only because Yaakov really wanted to take it easy a little bit. It's only because of that. And why does Yosef have to suffer? Why does this whole thing have to come to, why does he have to suffer? Rabotai. This whole entire story has something great to teach us. It's a tremendous, tremendous Musa to teach us. We need to understand that in this week's parasha, there's a certain reality that is taking place, that is forming. New reality is forming. Bnei Yaakov, the sons of Yaakov, settled down in the, settled down in the land, they become big in numbers, relatively speaking. They have financial stature. They are rich. They have a lot of cattle. 
nobody will mess around with them you know there <laughs> nobody will mess around with them but together with that pay attention we always forget to pay attention to this Akadosh Baruch sp- stops talking to them Akadosh Baruch spoke to the Avot he, you don't see anywhere Vayomer Hashem Yehuda. Vayomer Hashem Naftali. he doesn't talk yes we explained it last week in terms of the, the blemish that the Malach of Esav had caused to the Netzach where the, the flow, he, he broke the pipe in which prophecy comes down. But nevertheless, HaKadosh Baruch does not communicate with them. And, and not only he doesn't communicate with them, he doesn't even talk to Yaakov at all. The only time he talks to him is when he left Eretz Israel, and then right when he's about to leave, to Mitzrayim, then HaKadosh Baruch Hu talks to him again. This whole entire time, with that, years have gone by, there's no communication. I mean, why? How come we never pay attention to it? So, I'm a little uncomfortable saying that, but Lichora, it might seem, in a way, HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not dwell. And the reason why I'm not comfortable with that because because certain segments of, of people try to make a living out of that, that the Gadosh Baruch Hu does not communicate with the Jews, therefore he left them. No, that's not accurate. Okay, that's, so I'm a little uncomfortable with that. But uh, it seems like the Gadosh Baruch Hu does not dwell among them anymore. They're, they operate on their own. And the Gadosh Baruch Hu therefore talks or communicates to them through what we call a prophetic dream. A dream that comes... That it's not just a dream that you dream about what you know, what you obsessed all day, all day long, or your or your inner thoughts. That's a dream that carries a certain type of prophecy to it. That sometimes would be able to tell things about your own future from your dreams. This is a very special type of dream, and we need to understand that Akados another type of. Akados <laughs> Baruch Hu wanted to fulfill his promise to the Avot, to the forefathers. To the patriarchs to make them legoi gadol, la asotam legoi gadol, but because of the reality that has taken place, you can you, this could not be it, it can happen. And let's see why. You have to understand this very very carefully. If you look at it quickly, you know if we go back to Parashat Ben Abetarim. When the Kadosh Baruch Hu made the covenant with Abraham Avinu, uh, he says to him, uh, that your descendants will be will be resident alien in a country that is not going to be theirs, um, and they're going to work for the people, and they're going to torture the Jews, etc., etc., and then they're going to leave Berechush Gadol, and then they're going to come up with with a lot of money. Etc. Etc. The fourth generation they're gonna come here. In a way, Donar Midbar also is not going to come. Dorevi, fourth generation. And we need to again pay attention. For the fact that they sat comfortably in the land, there was a great danger of assimilation with the people of the land. And it doesn't start like right away, all right, let's go get married, let's put a Christmas tree, let's put a Hanukkah menorah. It doesn't happen all of a sudden. It happens slowly, slowly. If you look, for example, at uh, the women of Esav, he, they were chitiot. You know, he took uh, chiti women. Uh, they came with the two women, they came outside of what was accepted in that family circle to go to a specific source to take. He just took people from where they were around him. Uh, if we see the danger in which, uh, uh, or the problem, or the incident that Dina had to, to go through, uh, it was a friendly interaction. They, she had friends, they, she had buddies. I called to and before you know, a horrible incident of, of rape and molestation had occurred. And why did it happen? Because she interacted with them. They came, the Midrash tells us, they came, they, 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 they play music to her, let's be friends, and the guys didn't come, the girls came. And then it was all over. Um, 
You know what? Even Yehuda married a Canaanite woman. So that's a that's a tremendous danger. On top of that, on top of that, the family is falling apart. Pay attention. The family is falling apart. Uh, and when the family does not have a purpose, whether the purpose is a religious purpose, a national purpose, any kind of a purpose, any kind of a goal, uh, well, therefore, they need to go to Mitzrayim as free men. And in Mitzrayim, we all know the great love, quote-unquote, the great hatred of Egyptians to anybody foreigner, especially those who came from Canaan, especially those Canaanite Jews with the beards, you know, big and almost like me, no? <laughs> right? They hated everybody. And, and it seems, if you pay attention, that that hatred of the Egyptian to anything foreign was the core of condensation which created the Jews to come around each other because the Egyptians would not allow them to, to, to get involved with them. It was their hatred. How many times it happened here? We know many communities of people that live in different countries where there was great animosity for the Jews. If you would marry a woman who is not Jewish, one from the people, they will kill you and her. So therefore, those communities stayed intact. Okay, they maybe did not build mega yeshivot and so on, but they kept a certain Jewish identity for generations, which is a miracle by itself. Because, in a way, without Torah, how can you maintain any kind of identity? But yet, that hatred of the people around them forced them to come, to come apart together. So, when those communities came here to America, and all of a sudden there's not such out in the open animosity, and Isha, Yashar, Ben say, do whatever you want, we see how they fall apart. And we see how Jewish kids all of a sudden lose their Jewish grace and face, and it started with clothing and with names. Every Michael becomes a Mike. Every David becomes a David. Every Yeshua becomes a Josh. Every Ari. Ah, oh, my Ari's here, I'd say. Oh. Malkiel becomes a Tuvia. <laughs> That's good. That's good. You know? So, all they are vote, and, and you, you think about it. It was it was really terrible. All the avot, and now we're going back to the we're going back to the family. All the avot when they had a similar situation, you know, of a child coming, or the kids are growing, and now they need to make a, a decision who's going to be the heir, or because of bad behavior or something like this, what happened at that stage? One way or another, for one reason or another, they move one to the side and push the other one to be the heir. He was. The anointed one. Listen, maybe here, the Achim, you know, because they hated Yosef, and we see, I'm, I'm skipping the introduction of, of, of hating Yosef because that's why I want to concentrate on. So maybe here they also thought, they asked themselves, really, who is going to inherit daddy and who is going to be thrown away? I mean, we know that one inherits and then they are, and the rest go away. Look what Abraham did. You know, he sent everybody else. Maybe it will happen to us. And that altogether came to destroy everything. That was, that was in, by itself. And it was quite evident because, I mean, the Pasuk does tell us that Yaakov loved Yosef the most. I, I tell you the truth, I have a problem with that. I, I really do. I really do. I don't know if I, if I should say this, but I really, I mean, I really have a problem with this. You see that Yitzchak, when he had a troubled kid, really tried to do whatever he can to help him. And regardless of how much you love their wife, and you have, let's say, two wives, 
You love one over the other. The kids didn't do anything to you. The kids still look at you as... It's very bad to prefer one over the other or the rest. It's something for us to... Something for us to learn. Don't play favorites with your kids. Don't play favorites with your kids. And you'll see why the danger is. Why is that a problem? So... <laughs> And 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 uh, wasn't just the destruction of the family. It was a destruction of the future nation of Am Israel altogether. That we're talking about. They all knew that from Yaakov, Am Israel should become. So that means what? You are destroying the whole Am Israel here. And Yaakov Avinu did not have only two kids. He had twelve of them. Who is he going to pick? He has to pick one. Because that's what was done until that point. And therefore, you know, it's not only two kids, is 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 twelve kids, so it's six times the drama. More multiple. This is a big big melodrama here. I mean you can make like a, 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 a ever running show about Every time this one interaction and how he sees, I mean, it's crazy. So maybe you could you could understand why the Achim, the brothers, hated Yosef. Why the Achim thought that Yosef has a din of Rodef. He's going to be crowned. He comes in all the good boy. We are in the field. He is like walking all day long dreaming. California dreaming, and we're going to get thrown out. He's, he's doing it to throw us out. Yeah, maybe it's a dean of Rodef. So they did what they did. They thought he's going to inherit everything, and Yaakov is going to throw them out, because his dad is a little good boy. His dad is boy. Yaakov understands that. Yaakov is, 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 is a star guy. He understands that. And the Pasuk tells us, Yaakov Shamar et Adavar. He understood what's going on here. From the Chalamot, from the dreams. But Yaakov is trying to do something very interesting. You say, what are you, crazy Yaakov? You're sending your kid there? They hate him. Yaakov says, no. You know what? Maybe in the interaction of the house and the home, there's a certain energy that's going on. And in the home, everybody is, okay, you're the little kid, shut up. You're the big kid, I'll speak, you know. You know, big kid, old kid. So maybe in the dynamics of the home, it is really unsolvable. You can't solve this problem. So therefore, Yaakov is saying, ah, oh, i got an idea. The kids are all the way in Hebron, I know, they're going somewhere far in the field. I'll dress up yourself. I'll say, Yosef, go over there. Go talk to your brothers. Maybe being out in the field, you know, they'll still see he's coming along. They'll, a certain awareness of brotherly love or brotherly responsibility will come. You say, what are you doing there alone? Why are you coming alone? Don't you know there's a Al-Fatah there, you know? Mujahideen over there. Don't walk alone. But Yaakov doesn't understand one thing. He... Uh, he doesn't understand what the Pasuk tells us. No, I think the fourth Pasuk in the Pasha. It says, Velo yachlu achim dabro leshalom. So, Maze, what is exactly this, this shalom that we say? But they couldn't say, Hey, Yosef, how you doing? They couldn't talk to him in words of peace. They say, Yosef, you know, we love you. You know, we go, you know, you know, but we, what is it? Shal- what is. What is this? Lo yachlu dabro leshalom. If you look at it, it's they couldn't speak to him. To peace, they couldn't speak to him to peace. What does it mean? So, Rav Yonatan Eifshitz understands that there is a uh, is a, a hidden idea here, because he's 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 looking at the grammar, the way the language is. And it says, since the Achim, the brother, saw that he loves Yaakov, loves Yosef the most, then what did they do to him? They hated him. They hated Yosef. So Leifshitz does, in a way, like a Gzera Shava kind of a thing. I think we're going to make it. 
to the pasuk that we have in Sefer Vayikra, in Perek Yutet, uh, Perek Yutet, Pasuk Yudzayin, and it says, Lo tisna et achicha bilvavcha. You should not hate your brother in your heart. Bilvavcha. What does it mean, bilvavcha? If it's not bilvavi, I'm not telling you, let's say, I hate you. What is it, bilvavcha? And then the pasuk says, "Ocheach tochiach et amitecha." You should give your your fellow Jew a rebuke. Velo tisa alav chet, and don't carry a sin on him. So now let's look at the Rambam. What the Rambam says? Ah, what the Rambam says on that? If I can say, the Rambam says, "Kesha yichta ish leish." When a when a person does wrong to someone else, to another person. Don't keep your mouth shut and hate him. Or don't hate him, keep your mouth shut. Don't keep it inside. The story of Shalom and, and Amnon, everybody knows. Amnon raped his sister. He hated him. He hated him so much, he didn't say a word to him. Not good, not bad. He's heir to him. The way to do it is you commanded to tell him, velomarlo, and to say, What did you do like this to me? And why did you made a chet to me in, in whatever it is that you did. You have to give him rebuke. If the guy says, oh, listen, I'm sorry, you need to say, I'm sorry, I didn't know. And you should not be too cruel and say, you know what, I'm not going to say, and don't be too cruel say, you know what, I'm not going to say, and so on and so forth, and so on and so forth, Avraham prays to Hakadosh Baruch Hu. You see from here that that prayer or talking or talking is in a way like prayer. Veit palel diberito, lefalel liflol is ledaber. And what about I? This is this is fundamental. This is fundamental. Why? Because when you have this sensation of anger and it's not being filtered out there's after that there's a level of frustration and with this frustration there is a sensation of helplessness and then hatred uh, and then you might do something that's going to bring you to the point of no return just like when family gets divorced when family gets divorced, there is an ongoing, ongoing pressure and tension in the family, in the relationship, without an ability or an effort to speak. I can't talk to you because he's going to yell at me, or I can't talk to her because she's going to scream at me. There's no effort or ability to try to bridge the gap, or even to say, listen, I'm feeling, this is how I feel, and I'm entitled to my feeling. It doesn't mean that this is always going to bring you to a solution. However, you need to say, okay, you know what? It might not work. Or at least I know how you're feeling. And so on and so forth. I need to evaluate things. However, all of a sudden, because of this ongoing, unfiltered pressure, pressure like any other pressure needs a way out, then you do something that should not have been done, whatever that thing would be, and the family is destroyed. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. And then if the family is destroyed, therefore we have a problem. Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu promised the patriarchs, the Avot, that they're going to become a great nation. If the family is destroyed, there's no, no nation to come in here. So therefore HaKadosh Baruch Hu take this whole stressful situation and then spins it in such a way that the whole... Why? Because the whole concept of the existence of Am Yisrael depends on the unity of Am Yisrael. In other, in other words, that's a new concept here. There's not going to be any more a new, a one hair that is going to inherit and all is going to be. 
You are all going to be that. You are going to be the one. Each and every one of you is going to be the one. You are going to be my chosen people. I'm Israel. No more choosing one brother over the other. And you don't understand that. You don't understand. It's like a person has one child and this child drinks and smokes and, and what are you doing? There's no more one. You are the one. Who is you? You, plural you. Those who said that doesn't, that they don't understand that. They don't have this unity. And therefore, Therefore, he takes them all to Mitzrayim, because if you don't understand, let me recycle you. And Mitzrayim is referred to as Kura Barzel, the furnace in which they were, in a way, recycled and reformed from being complete, a broken, dysfunctional family to a united nation. Nation, not nations. Nation, the United Nations is more like a stable. I don't know why we have to pay taxes for that. You should sell the place and make a more out of it. But never mind, Let's, don't stop me with this. So you understand now why we go to Mitzrayim. You understand in a way why we went to Galut. Because the same thing happened to us when we went back to Eretz Israel. We were fighting. And the says, okay, out again. You don't understand. And we still don't understand. However, we have a problem because we are in Galut and now right now we are falling apart and there's nowhere else to fall from here besides flat on our floor. So it's something for us to start waking up and doing what we're doing. Unity is not just a word that is served for pulpit rabbis on the Sermon of Shabbat five minutes before Chulad. Unity is something that we should strive for and figure out ways to actually achieve. Unity does not mean appeasement. Unity, first of all, means communication. And we don't communicate. But now, I'm going to tell you something. Let's go a little Kabbalah. We have some time. We'll make it. Maybe a little late. The children to smell, let me tell you, too bad for the people watching that they can't smell it. This is like unbelievable children. You guys are... We should do like a, you know, reality show. Children masters, I don't know, whatever. There's pit masters, we got to do children masters. Hey, it's my idea, don't take it, yeah? So, okay, so the brothers come. This is a little long. Wow, it's a little too long. All right, who cares? You can sit here, you're my captive audience. So I'll talk to you anyway. Uh, Avid will wait a little bit. So, okay, so fine. So the brothers come in and the brothers sell, sell, they sell your stuff. And what did they sell it for? <laughs> they say at the end, nah, lime, shoes, Ferragamo shoes. They had to get shoes. They sold them for shoes. So the brothers come in and they sell. And they sell yourself for a three matbeot kesef, for 20 silver coins. And what would they do with those silver coins? Which is, sounds a little crazy. Each one of the ten brothers takes two, two silver coins and goes and buys shoes with them. It does not make sense. And when things don't make sense, we got to look at it a little different. We go to the Kabbalah. That's yeah. all to logic, but there's no logic. so Because it's, it's completely unexplainable. So let's see exactly what's going on. So to start with, we know that there is a spiritual reason. There is a reason for everything. And there is a spiritual reason for everything that is being done. We need to understand, and I don't think you ever ask yourself a question, why in the world do we wear shoes? Why do we wear shoes? I mean, your feet are squashed all day long. They hurt, they sweat, they smell. You know, why do we wear shoes? So they say that he who doesn't have shoes is disconnected from the light of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Me'ora boy is disconnected from the light of the boy. Therefore, the spiritual reason is that that is the spiritual reason why we have to wear shoes. Doesn't make sense. But let's expand a little bit. So the reason is that we wear shoes according to the Mekubalim. It's not because, because it's comfortable, because sometimes it's really uncomfortable. Because we know that many negative uh, entities were created 
were created at the time of Adam Arishon. When Adam Arishon sinned, that's one of the reasons also that we were clothes. Beged, we were begadim, because Adam Arishon bagad, he betrayed it. We wear clothing. And, and the reason why we wear clothing in Sniut can take a different reason all of a sudden because we understand the magnitude of the sin. Therefore, we have to wear Tzanua clothes. That's why, guys, I know it's a little cold out. Don't wear shorts. It's good when you're three years old, but, you know, not when you're 30. Sorry. <laughs> you can wear shorts for the shower. But <laughs> anyway, so... We, so, so Adam Rishon created all these things. So we know that one of them is the fact that Adama, the, the earth, which really represents uh, uh, physical, homer, materialism, and, and became a power force that separates men from Makadosh Baruch Hu. Is we are too physical to embrace in, in, in or immerse in physicality, right? So we say in a way that Kadosh told the land, the earth, that the land mekulelity, she is cursed. The earth is cursed. But we know really that this is not a klala, but a reality that was created. That because of this reality, the earth is cursed. The earth by itself is not. So when a person operates in a selfish way, as much as we all did when we were all part of Adam Rishon, all the neshamot, all the souls were a part of this big soul that's called Adam Rishon. As much as all the neshamot of Am Israel are represented by the Shvatim, it's, it's parallel. So all this neshama, we were selfish. Our part, each one of us as the part of this big neshama, we involved in selfish acts. And uh, the adama, or in other words, materialism in this in this uh, in in this in this realm, became a a physical power that separates us from Akadosh Baruch Hu, from spirituality. The adama, the earth, represents. Gashmiut, physical form. And wearing shoes is the secret how, in a way, to separate ourselves from that separating force. Now you understand why in Bet HaMikdash, which represent the world the way it should have been, the Kohanim did not wear shoes. Now you understand why it says... Moshe, Moshe, Moses, take off your shoes. Shal na'alecha me'al raglecha. Ke ha'makom asher atar dorech alav adamat kodeshu. This is a holy place. Take your shoes off. Do you understand? That's why we don't pray to a Kadosh Baruch Hu barefoot. Because we are still guilty. We are selfish. You, you see how all of a sudden it all makes sense. But we don't think about it. So, that power that separates us, right, is, is more than that. And look, I'll give you another example. Did you ever think about wearing army boots or combat boots, you know, or steel toe shoes in, on, a, on a Caribbean beach, go somewhere, you know, with the water going like this, and the palm trees in the wind and you know like it's nice right do you ever think oh to go there can't wait to go to put my army boots on right do you see the symbolism you want to, what do you want to do you want to roll your pants you want to take your clothes off you want to walk barefoot because you know oh it's a tape, I'm sorry, tape. I'm still in the uh, Stone Age. But yes, truly, this hack. Right? You see the representation. That place, those kind of, of, of untainted places, represent to us a return to Eden. 
going back to Gan Eden. What do we do? Take our shoes off. We never think about this, but that's why we do it. So if we learn from the air, right, that when we do a ma'aseh, an action that connects us for, 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 for the selfishness of, of, of us, of the physical, the selfishness of the physical, there's two things that take place. Two things that happen. So let's say, for example, the person thinks that somebody does something bad to him. So therefore he becomes angry to this person, like we usually do. So by doing so, we actually fulfilled two things. Two things happen. The first one is by this action, this negative action, you brought negativity into your own life. And of course, if you hate somebody, the more you hate him, the more he's connected to you, the less you're going to be able to separate from him. And you give him koach, so therefore he, he's, he, he gets all his power, his energy from you. He's like a spiritual leech. So don't hate people. You're wasting your energy. And, and more than that, which is maybe worse, is now that you took your shoes in of you in a spiritual manner of course you connected yourself right now to the curse of the physical world now you are attached to the physical world there's nothing to separate you now you understand why maybe it's good not to wear the shoes of a dead man or to wear the shoes of a wicked man when we are connected uh, to this physical world, right? The world or the physical world that we're at, the Olam HaChomer. When we go into it, we separate ourselves from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So what is our spiritual work to do? What is the spiritual work? To completely disconnect yourself completely as much as we can from that ego, from, the, from that part of us that strive for selfishness from that need that we have to receive only which is really the physical the physical form of this world therefore when we do something negative well, we are involved in a negative act so not only that we bring us off something negative upon ourselves we also connected more into the bad side and then we become trapped we can't, it's like it's like uh, quicksand you know Quicksand, you need to be able to float yourself up and pull yourself out. The more you move, the more, the faster you go down. That's exactly what happens here. So when we are connected, that we are, in a way, reconnecting all the time to the original curse that applied to Akadosh, to Akadosh, by Akadosh Baruch Hu, to, to Adam Arishon. And with the amount that you are immersed with Gashmiut with physical matter, this is the amount in which you bring Rabotai darkness to your life. The light of Akadosh Baruch Hu is the light of your life. When, when you're disconnected from Him, darkness comes upon you. And it only comes upon you when you push it out by being selfish, by being immersed with physical matters, even at the most important part. Of looking for your spouse when you only look in at her or his physique you are bringing a curse to yourself this is the klala you are not connected to the spiritual part of that person you're doomed you're doomed that's it so the secret of the shoes is, is again is not in the in the shoes that we are wearing, but rather in our ability to disconnect ourselves from the curse or from this from this physical uh, uh, mud of this world. And when you do so, you know, slowly, slowly, that curse that is is threatened to swallow all of us is is slowly being removed from us. That klipa, that husk, that shell, slowly is removed from us. It's not all about you. And, and 
you know, if you again, if you if we go back for one second to the Caribbean beach, you know, when we go to this Caribbean beach, right, we allow ourselves to, or no, we allow ourselves not to wear clothes that would signify how or what is our placement in the food chain. If I'm wearing this kind of clothes, I'm fancy clothes, I'm that kind of clothes, I'm allowed to myself to wear maybe a pair of jeans and, and a t-shirt and walk barefoot and everybody there looks more or less the same because it's not about physical anymore. Again, only when we take ourselves from, from, from Fifth Avenue and we bring ourselves to some kind of, a, of an island, only then we are allowed to undress ourselves from the externalism of our life and really hopefully be connected to really who we are and that's why you might find a multi-millionaire who's walking down with a nice linen shirt and rolled up khaki pants and he's having a beer next to you and you won't even know that this is a Harry Clapton or I don't know whoever the heck it is he's just another person and to that point no matter it doesn't make a difference if he's Harry Clapton or, or, or Arthur Rubinstein he's just a nice person to have a drink beer with but here you you, you can do it, and he wouldn't allow you to do it. And here we are, because we're in different placements in the food chain. Because we are completely in this place that we are, completely immersed with externalism and humriyut, materialism, which kills us all. It makes us break away from Makados Baruch So... This is, this, is, this is what we need to pay attention. That's why they sold him. They sold him for shoes. They figured that what they did was wrong, and they knew what he was engaged was wrong. They felt completely disconnected. It was representation of that. So Rabotai, we're a little late. Let's try to... Let's try to separate a little bit and be a little different. Let's try not to hate, not to be selfish. Let's make sure that we are connected appropriately to the light of the Kaddosh Baruch Hu. Let's allow Him to bring the light into our lives. Right? Enough for nothing. Look at it. This is a Yofi. Two seconds. When we sing Banu Choshech Legaresh, Banu Choshech Legaresh, we came away to scare away darkness. The darkness is the darkness of, of the Greek Empire, of externalism. Be'yadenu Ol Vaesh, with light and fire. Why light and fire? The passion and the light of the Torah. That's the only way. There's nothing, I guess, more, even though we're like a week away from Hanukkah, but I still, I can still smell the donuts, as they say. It's, this is, this is very symbolic. So I think we should do that. So Rabbi I wish all the Shabbat Shalom, and uh, don't forget to shine your shoes.